Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the first content-based lecture of the course for Art 128. Uh, hopefully at this point you have looked through, I expect you to have looked through, the introductory lectures outlining your responsibilities uh, in the course as well as the lecture that is designed to kind of introduce you to art history. Um, we went over things pretty quickly that time and so now as we go into our first week of real content for the course, what I'll be trying to do is pick up some of the ideas that you first were introduced to last week and apply those to works of art that are, uh, you know, that are in the first, I don't know, couple of weeks of this course that all um, come from the tradition of classical arts. So with that in mind, as with all of these lectures, I presume that at this point you will have first downloaded the lecture guide so that you can follow along with the lecture and know uh, the key terminology that I'll be covering in the lecture. Uh, you'll see all the artists' names, the names of the major paintings and sculptures that we'll be covering, uh, as well as any kind of key terminology. These things will turn up later on when we get to quizzes or they'll turn up when I'm asking you about, uh, you know, writing essays for your summary essays or discussion posts. Uh, and so you want to take good notes on this. You don't want to keep having to return to the lectures every time I ask you to write a paper uh, or uh, answer a discussion post, right? The other thing that I presume that you will have done and I think it's always a good idea to do this in advance of the lecture is to have gone through the readings and read those over carefully and taken good notes on the readings as well. Now I'm going to be explaining some of the key ideas from the lectures, or I'm sorry, from the readings in these lectures, but I'm not going to explain every single component of the reading. That would be kind of redundant. So make sure you then download and print out the lecture guide so you can follow along that you've done the readings and if you're struggling at all with what is important in those readings, make sure that you download the reading guide and look through that and can answer the questions that I've posed there. And then go on to these lectures that will be analyzing the key works of art and placing them within their historical, social, and cultural context, which is what I find most interesting about art history itself. So with that in mind, um, and you'll see this a lot in these lectures, I'm going to toggle over to my desktop here so that you'll start seeing on the right hand side of the screen my, basically a, it's a kind of PowerPoint presentation. Um, we'll get into this. So um, before talking about the image that you now see on the screen to your right, and remember, as I said before, if you want to see these images bigger, just maximize the screen off to the right and minimize my talking head so that you can just kind of hear me speaking about things. Let's talk a little bit about the time period that we're starting this course off in. Um, the course starts at the end of the 18th century, so the beginning of the, se or, sorry, the end of the 1700s, and and we really start and we spend most of our time in this class in France. And the reason for this is that France was basically the cultural center of the world through the 19th century and frankly right up until World War II when that center kind of shifts at least for, uh, for most artists to New York. And that's a longer story that we'll get into at the end of the quarter. But what I mean by this is that France was kind of a cultural mecca. Uh, artists from Germany and, you know, Italy and England and other parts of Western Europe, if they were very ambitious, wanted to show their works in France because it was such, it, it was such a kind of cultural icon. Now, at the end of the 1700s in France, we have some really interesting things going on in the world that have a great deal to do with why the particular style of neoclassicism, which is the first style we'll be covering in this class, was adopted in France at this time, and how it changed uh, in response to some of the things going on in the world. What I mean by this is that at the end of the 1700s, some of you know, France goes through the French Revolution. This starts in 1789, just after the first artist we'll be looking at in this class, um, and we'll pick those major ideas up as we approach that art. But back to the style that is adopted in 
France at this time period, the end of the 1700s, you know, end of the 18th century. Neoclassicism, as the term kind of references, means new classicism. Now, classical arts had been around for a very, very long time. We, we call classicism or classical aesthetics a trans-historical style. And all that means, unlike the period styles that you will have read about or individual styles or cultural styles, is that classical ideas started way back there with the early Greeks. And right now you're looking at on your screen an early Greek sculpture by Polyclitus, known as the Doryphoros or spear bearer. These start then somewhere around 450 BCE in classical Athens. And, you know, they run through the time period of the great Alexander the Great in the, you know, in the 300s BCE. And then as Greece collapses uh, through the extensions of Alexander the Great, and if you've taken an early art history class from me, you will know this story. Um, that classical tradition dies off for a brief period only to be reinvigorated in Roman times. And then, of course, Rome uses this classical style for its own sculptures and paintings and even architecture. And, and then Rome collapses under its own weight and we go through the so-called dark ages. But then classicism reemerges during the Italian Renaissance with great artists such as Michelangelo and Leonardo and Raphael and so forth. And then of course we go through a series of other stylistic movements and then at the end of the 1700s, classicism re-emerges again. That's what we mean by a trans-historical style. Another way to put this is, you know, I think everyone's familiar with classical music, even if you hate it. Um, and so if someone says, hey, that's classical music, you know, violins and orchestral music and certain arrangements of sound. Um, but within classical music, of course, there are a whole host of different variations of classicism. And that's what we see in the classical arts. So classicism first starts in Greece, and we'll talk a little bit about what it meant for the Greeks, and then I'll take you through how it shows up for the Romans and how it shows up in the Renaissance kind of briefly. So as to talk about some of the key characteristics of this style and how they get adapted at the end of the 18th century uh, in France uh, for their own particular ends. So remember what we said about style. Style is a, an aesthetic philosophy, meaning a belief in why the art should look the way that it does and what it's supposed to achieve. That's what we mean by aesthetic philosophy. It also, though, is a group of general visual characteristics that we expect to find in particular works of art produced by particular cultures during particular time periods. And remember what we said about this. The presumption of art history is always that artworks reflect the values and ideological assumptions and things going on in the world of the culture that produce that art. And if that is the case, if art kind of mirrors in some way, and it's not super simple, but if it reflects or mirrors or represents these values, one would expect during a particular time period, art would share common characteristics. That's what a style is. Now, in our class, which is primarily devoted to the art of the 19th and early 20th century, um, stylistic movements within this time period are very consciously adopted. These artists strive to do particular things. Sometimes they're setting themselves apart from the art that just came before it on purpose. They're deriving new aesthetic philosophies and so forth. So during the 19th century, all the way up into our contemporary age, we see a kind of a intensification of the changes in styles over this time period. Or another way to put this is while the Italian Renaissance with its classical style might have you know, lasted close to 250 years, if not longer, when we get to the 19th century and early 20th century, stylistic movements might change out or be overshadowed by a new stylistic movement within 10, 15 years. So with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about what some of the basic ideas of classicism are, and then we'll talk about how these show up 
in the French Royal Academy, where you had a reading by Nicholas Poussin and then another reading by Sir Joshua Reynolds on the English Royal Academy, how they show up there, and then look at some of the art of, uh, of Jacques-Louis David in particular and other artists who adopted the classical style, called it neoclassicism during the late 18th, early 19th century. Okay, so you're looking at then, and this is the first artist listed on your lecture guide, Polyclitus's famous Doryphoros, or rather this is a Roman copy of a Greek original that has been lost. In fact, most of the marble sculptures that you see from Greece, just as a kind of anecdotal fact, are Roman copies of original Greek sculptures that usually were in bronze um, that have been lost uh, over the ages. The Romans, of course, loved everything Greek. Now, the reason I bring this in, and if you've had a history course before or you know something about art history, you'll know that this time period around 450 or so BCE was really important in Greece because art changes from being really schematic, um, not very lifelike, or what we call in art history naturalistic, to, to start to look really like human forms, particularly in, the, in these representational sculptures. And the question has always been like, why? What were they up to? Did they just get better at carving sculptures and that's why they look more lifelike? And the answer is not really. Um, the answer really has to do with changes in the way that the Greeks thought about what sculpture was supposed to do and what painting was supposed to do and what they were trying to achieve in this sculpture. It was a, a different society, you know, early democracy uh, or at least semi-democracy and an interest, and this is the key idea, in humanism. Humanism is the idea, briefly put, that humans are striving to perfect themselves, right? They want to make themselves better and better, every generation getting a little bit better, contributing to a society that gets a little bit better. And this, you know, takes place in multiple different ways. We think of, for instance, uh, during Greek society, them developing early new forms of government like democracy. We think of the Greeks as contributing to the sciences and philosophy and writing and poetry and so forth. All of these are part of the humanistic aspiration to make ourselves better and better from one age to the next and to make those around us better as well. So with that in mind then, these works of art, one should think of them, and the Doryphoros is no exception, as not really representing naturalistic form. Remember, naturalism means a form that looks like a real thing in the real world but isn't necessarily a direct copy of a real human being. Or here, for instance, we wouldn't say this is realistic because we don't know whether this represents a real person or whether it's just supposed to look like a general person. Realism, as a term in art history, means it looks like an actual thing in the real world. It's like a, a photographic copy of it. Whereas naturalism means more it looks like a real human being, but it's not based on any particular human being per se. But here, a more accurate term for the Doryphoros and for all classical works of art, whether they be from Greece or Rome or the Renaissance or the neoclassical period that we'll be getting to partway through this lecture, is that they're idealistic. Idealism, I'm sure you know, is to make things look better than they actually look in the real world. In this case, to make the human being an example of the perfect man, the perfect sets of proportions, the perfect body, and the perfect, in this case, aspect. In that case, what I mean is emotional response to the world or the perfect kind of moral thinking about the world here that we see on his face. So all classical works of art are striving to be idealistic, the perfect manifestation in this case of the perfect human being who can then be a kind of representation or embodiment or even model for all of us to strive for this type of perfection, right? So this starts again in ancient Greece and let's talk a little bit about the aesthetic philosophy or belief system that goes along with it by looking at very briefly and 
again, this is just a kind of backdrop to neoclassicism, so I don't want to go into it in great amounts of detail, but I do want to give you the aesthetic philosophy so that you can see how it gets adapted in neoclassical period. And in this case, that aesthetic philosophy extends pretty directly to Plato, the great Greek philosopher. So on your screen now, you see a little schematic um, that is labeled Platonic Truth. And again, I'm not going to try to tell you everything about Plato that I know. What I want to do is try to explain to you why ideals or perfection was so important for the Greeks and how these ideas then show up in Western culture, you know, thousands of years later with slight modification. If you've ever read Plato before, if you've read any of the uh, philosophers in the analytic tradition all the way up until the modern period, you'll know that one of the things that philosophers are consistently at pains to do is to describe or to assert what we sometimes call objective truths rather than subjective truths. And objective truth is something that is not a matter of opinion or subjective interpretation. An objective truth presumes that certain truths, certain things in the world, are true universally. That means for all people, in all times, in all places, some type of truth is true for them. And I'm speaking very abstractly, but that's the way that, of course, philosophers speak. So, for instance, a good example of this might be, you have probably heard the statement that beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. And while I think today in our world most of us believe that is true, that there are many different kinds of beauty, and beauty is a matter of subjective interpretation, for Plato it wasn't true at all. And for most of the uh, philosophers through the ages, there was such a thing called beauty with a capital B that should be universal and timeless, which all people would see and say, that is beautiful. See, the analytic philosophers wanted to make claims that were objective and they needed a way to prove or some kind of schematic organization of the world that would help to support their claims about truth. And so here what we see on this schematic in front of you <clears throat> is a, a basic kind of rendering of the way that Plato went about proving universal truths. And again, I'm not going to go into all the details, but let's put it this way. Plato believed that the world that we all live in, the world that we perceive through our senses, was actually an imperfect reflection of a more perfect, universal, timeless, transcendent world that he referred to, or that we refer to through translation, as the realm of forms, or the realm of the idos. This realm of forms for Plato was constant, it didn't change, it had within it all of these conceptual or abstract ideas that were perfect. And our world then partially partook of this perfection in that it was an imperfect reflection of that realm of perfection. Now, the example I usually get when I'm in a, give when I'm in a face-to-face -face lecture is, imagine you're, you're watching me lecture and I put up in front of you three different types of chairs on the lecture stage. And I say to the class, hey, what are you looking at up here? And, you know, at least one student will say, you're look, I'm, we're looking at chairs, right? And then I say something like, yeah, but look at these different chairs. Are they all the same? And I've, of course, picked three different types of chairs. And students will say, no, they don't look all the same, but we recognize them as a chair. That's an object lesson for Plato's ideas here. See, what Plato would say is that the reason we're able to understand these three different manifestations of chair is that they all partake of the basic concept chair or chairness, right? They all are imperfect reflections of some perfect concept chair up there in the world. Now, if you get this, again, you have to think abstractly, substitute for chair something like beauty. So Plato would say in the realm of forms, there is this quality of beauty up there that's universal and timeless. And every once in a while, when we're walking around the world, we see a person or we see a landscape or we see a building and we say, wow, that's beautiful. And what Plato would say is that it is 
an approximation of beauty, or it partakes of particular aspects of beauty, but it's an imperfect reflection of beauty. The reason I'm bringing this up is that with this philosophy, then, artists, instead of trying to represent the way that the world looked, let's say one of those examples of a chair that I put up on the stage, they would try to represent the perfect chair or the perfect beauty. They try to idealize things because they really believed that if they showed you perfection, if they showed you these ideals, it would bring you closer to this more perfect realm of forms and perfect realm of the universal timeless concepts, which would break through the barriers of our subjective experience of the world. That's a fancy way of saying something like artists weren't, and as far as I know, up until the 19th century, and even then we've got some questions about this, we're not really interested in representing the way the world looked. They're almost always representing uh, a different idea, a perfect way of the world looking or a perfect way of the world being. They're interested in perfection over and over again within the classical tradition. You'll see on this schematic as well, below the realm of the phenomenal realm, remember that's where we live. It's re of a reflection of the world of forms, a truth at one remove. You see arrows pointing down and you see me uh, typing in there, mimetic arts. Mimetic arts for Plato are arts that literally try to copy the way the world look. They mime the way the world look. And as Plato pointed out, if a work of art perfectly reflects the way that the world looks, it's not very useful because it itself is then an imperfect reflection of the phenomenal realm, which is already an imperfect reflection of the realm of concepts. Again, this is just a way to say to you that in the classical tradition, artists who could per perfectly copy the way the world looks weren't held in high esteem because the goal was not to represent the way the world looked, but to represent a perfect world, a perfect human being, perfect moral character, perfect in every single way. You wanted to represent something that was closer to the realm of the perfect than the realm that we all lived in. Now for Plato as well, and this is very important in the classical tradition, um, truth and beauty and goodness, which you see here on this schematic, were all intertwined. You could not take one without the other. See, the Greeks believed that if something was beautiful, it also necessarily was true and good. They actually believed that beauty had what was called a, uh, a moral quality to it, what the Greeks called erete. Erete is just kind of the moral kind of perfection of the universe. And uh, again, in the classical tradition, the idea here is that if you represent something that is beautiful, you're also representing something that is morally good and universally true. So for instance, representing, if I backtrack here, Polycleitus as uh, the Duriferos here by Polycleitus, if you represent the perfect human being, you're bringing people into contact, not just with something that is ideal physically, you're bringing them into contact with something that is ideal morally and ideal in the realm of knowledge. It's true and it's good. Now, while we are still here on the Duriferos, I want to point out that one of the key ideas to making something perfect for the Greeks was to create a perfect commensurate ratio of body parts. Or a better way to put this is the proportionality of Greek sculptures is, uh, is perfect. They called this symmetria, a perfect commensurability of parts to one another. And the way that this worked for the Greeks, and there are many variations on this, is that mathematical proportions were used more often than not to determine, for instance, the relationship between the digit on one finger, let's say from the knuckle to the end of your finger, to the entire finger. So for instance, that ratio, which you can all measure your fingers, and I've done this in class before, is roughly three to one. There are three one digit portions of the finger to an entire finger would be a ratio you would find throughout the body or used to generate that perfect 
set of proportions in the body. So then the Greeks might go on to say that that same proportion should be used to determine the length of the hand from the palm to the end of the finger in relation to the entire length of the arm. Again, three to one. And the same between the foot and the leg and other proportions were used throughout the body, but all of these strict mathematical ratios in the body were a way to derive perfection in the body and to make it universally beautiful. Does that make sense to everyone? I hope so. Another set of proportions used in the body were a number of heads to the entire body, usually about seven heads to the entire body length and on and on and on. Another thing that continues all the way through our con uh, contemporary time period that we'll be starting with in neoclassicism is this face here. The Greeks and Plato believe that the rational mind was the most kind of important component of the human being. A rational mind that is interested in rational responses to the world in science and computation and analytic philosophy and rational relations in theater and drama and music and so forth. We hear it today, right? The idea is that emotions for the Greeks were something that while all humans have them can get in the way of the rational mind. Maybe when you're a little kid, you got angry at someone for, you know, stealing your bike or bullying you around and you really got angry and you wanted to punch them or something like that. Way back with the Greeks, they said, that's completely understandable. But just like your parents, the Greeks would say, but let's take a deep breath. Let's think our way through it. How do we rationally respond to this emotional response? How do we do this in a way that will result in a better outcome? And so when you see these Greek sculptures that look like they're kind of gazing off into the distance without any determinate uh, emotional quality, they're not happy, they're not sad, they just seem to be stoic. That is because the Greeks wanted to show the rational mind in operation, what they called the ethos of the human being. So let's go forward a little bit here. That's just a basic kind of introduction to the aesthetic philosophy and some of the stylistics that go along with idealism in the neoclassical tradition and classical tradition going all the way back to the Greeks. If you move forward to the Roman period, and again, I'm just giving you a brief backdrop. None of these works uh, are going to show up on quizzes or be um, you know, used in assignments. They're just meant to kind of give you object lessons on the tradition of classicism. What you see now on the screen in front of you is on the left-hand side, a Roman work called the Augustus Prima Porta uh, by an unknown sculpture. It's probably a, a, a copy of an original. Uh, that's from around uh, the time of Christ, so right around the first century AD. And you see it juxtaposed or compared against the Doriferos again. Now, hopefully most of you can see these are basically the same sculptures. They have the exact same proportions in the body. And part of the reason for that is that the Romans, of course, loved everything Greek and saw themselves as inheriting the classical tradition from the Greeks. But you also see some changes here, some adaptations to it. Number one, uh, you know, the Augustus Prima Porta represents an actual human being. This is Octavian, Gaius Octavian, who becomes Octavian Augustus, the first major Caesar. He's the guy who inherits kind of the, the rule from, not directly, but uh, at arm's length from Julius Caesar. He goes on to uh, kind of cement Roman rule, and he's the first of the major Roman leaders. Now, the reason that he has chosen the body of the Doriferos as his own body in this sculpture is because of this idea. He wants to tell everyone he is the personification of perfection. And since he's the personification of perfection, he is also true and he is also good because these things go along with ideal beauty. He has, however, put on his body here some armor. There's a whole host of symbolism that associates this directly with Roman rule that we're not going to go into here. But the basic idea is the same. We represent ideal bodies, ideal proportionality, a very stoic response to the world because we want these sculptures to embody those ideals that come from classical arts. And the Romans did this not only in their sculpture, 
but also importantly in their architecture and in much of their painting as well. So it's the second manifestation of classicism in history. Now if we jump forward a little bit here to the Renaissance period, and now we're talking about, we're looking at Leonardo da Vinci's work. So the end of the 15th century, beginning of the 16th century, end of the 1400s, beginning of the 1500s, we see classicism reemerge again here in Italy after the so-called Dark Ages or Mid Medieval Ages. What you see on your screen here is a very famous work by Leonardo da Vinci known as the Vitruvian Man. I haven't put it on your, your lecture guide. It's something that I presume most people are aware of. Um, but the idea, and again, this is just a b brief backdrop, is to show you how the Renaissance artist, again, readopted classical aesthetics and classical principles later on in history. What the Vitruvian Man is really, what you're seeing here is a page from one of Leonardo's notebooks, is Leonardo looking back over an ancient Roman author by the name of Vitruvius. Vitruvius was, among other things, the chief architect for Julius Caesar. And reading in this passage from the earlier Roman author, a page where Vitruvius says, the perfect human being is this. This is what we call a canon of proportions. A canon of proportions is a set of modules or relationships, as I've talked about before, that adhere throughout the body. So if you look at this sculpture, or I'm sorry, this drawing, and just follow my cursor here, and you see these little lines put here between the finger and the arm, and the arm again here, these are all perfect mathematical proportions that are used to generate the perfect body. What Vitruvius specifically said is that a perfect human being's center is their navel, such that if they are lying on the ground with their arms outstretched and you put the pointy end of one of those drawing compasses in their belly button and drew around their arm, outstretched arms and outstretched legs, they would fit perfectly within that circle, which is what you see here. He further said that the height of a human being is exactly the same as in a perfect human being this is, as their length if you went from outstretched arms to outstretched arms. The whole point of this is just to say that all those Renaissance artists, Leonardo, Michelangelo, Raphael, and many others were very interested in creating perfect human bodies and perfect paintings because these perfect forms would be models and fill the world with things that would lead us towards greater and greater degrees of perfecting ourselves. And this is just a, one example. Again, we call these perfect sets of ratios used to generate a perfect body a canon of proportions. Now, remember this, the aesthetic philosophy in Greek times, um, because the Greeks were not Christian, didn't ever invoke the idea necessarily of gods or of certainly not Christian gods. But during the Renaissance where everyone is Christian and in, in the age that we're going into in neoclassicism, most of the artists were Christian at least partially in a very kind of Christian world. Many of the artists and thinkers of the Renaissance forward would take ancient what they considered pagan ideas and pagan philosophies and try to mix them together with Christian theology. And in the Renaissance, one of the most interesting manifestations of this, which shows up in their own aesthetic philosophy is what we call Neoplatonism or New Platonism. Now, New Platonism is a set of complex ideas, but I've rendered it very simply here in a way that I think most people can understand. Now, the, the artists and thinkers of the Italian Renaissance, you know, in the 14 and 1500s, loved the Greeks. They loved Greek philosophy, but they're all Christian. And so they had to meld together Christian ideas with these ideas from the Greek philosophers. And one of the ways they did this was, and I'll just give you a kind of brief rundown of this, is that let's say they love Plato. They looked at Plato's thinking, they said, yes, okay, Plato says that our world in which we live is an imperfect reflection of a, the realm of forms, which is universal and timeless and transcendent, full of perfection, full of objective truths and so forth. 
And they say during the Renaissance something like, well, that sounds, Plato's realm of form sounds really similar to our ideas about our Christian God and heaven because Christians presume that their God is universal and timeless and transcendent and he knows all things and he's perfect, right? So heaven must be perfect like that. Furthermore, though, Christians believe that God created the world and he created man. And because they believe that their God is perfect and because in the Bible it says that man and woman was created in God's image, they believe that there's something of God's perfection in this world around us. Yeah, it makes perfect sense, right? Something of God's perfection has to be in this world around us. It may not be quite apparent, uh, but it's there somewhere. And so one of the ways to think about this is if we add to the mix of uh, old classical philosophers, Aristotle's ideas, sometimes this can help clarify things. Um, Aristotle, of course, came after Plato, and in his own philosophy, he tried to kind of change Plato's ideas a little bit or assert his own ideas. And so what Aristotle said was, I, I think Plato's pretty much right. There are universal timeless truths in the world. However, I don't believe that those universal timeless truths are separate from the phenomenal world in which we live. They're not separate from the world in which we exist. They just exist beneath the appearance of things. They're there around us, but it takes what Aristotle started calling empirical observation. So careful analytic observation of the world in order to find out what those truths were. And one way to put this that I find is really useful is if you've ever taken a physics class before, you'll, you'll learn, at least in introductory physics, once you get up into the higher realms of physics, all bets are off. But in intro physics, you'll learn that there are physical laws that govern the relation of bodies in the universe. You know, gravity is constant. Things fall at a particular speed. Um, there's all types of physical laws to the universe. That's kind of what Aristotle was talking about. They're not apparent to our eye. We don't see them necessarily unless we really carefully observe them. And then we realize there are rules, there are laws, there are truths in the world in which we live. The reason I bring up Aristotle is that this is much closer in a way to the ideas of Renaissance artists and thinkers. They thought, well, if God is perfect and he's all knowing and he's uh, all powerful and he made this world, and he made us in his image, there must be something of his perfection in this world, just like Aristotle said. Now, traditionally, the mediators or revealers of God's perfection in the world were the clergy, right? Priests and popes and so forth would show you God's, you know, laws in the universe, God's, what God wanted, what we call, um, you know, divine will in the universe. But during the Renaissance, artists started to argue that they did much the same thing. Artists started to say that they were divinely inspired, that God had put ideas or images in their head, or that they could see this perfection in the world. And what they started doing was creating what they wanted to believe were perfect works of art with perfect proportional human beings in them, acting perfectly in perfect settings with perfect perfect. Ex uh, aesthetics in it, meaning uses of line and shape and color and so forth, so that when a human being walked up to a painting or a sculpture, what they would see is not just something that was an Im incredible kind of, you know, skillful achievement. They would be brought in front of what was the closest approximation to God in the universe, something that was perfect, just like God was perfect. Humans weren't perfect, but art could be perfect. Art could create perfect bodies and so forth. And the idea here is that in so doing, in creating ideal works of art, you are brought into proximity to God or proximity to truth and goodness and beauty and all these things that a humanistic society was trying to achieve, making themselves better and better. So God is the divine craftsman making all things was very commensurate with Plato and Aristotle's ideas in ancient Greek philosophy and became the aesthetic philosophy of the Renaissance and classicism again now, but with a theological or Christian set of ideas attached to it too. To summarize this again, it's kind of this straightforward. If the rationale is complex, 
the, the idea of the aesthetic philosophy is really straightforward. It goes like this. If you create ideal beauty in your works of art, you are creating something that is the closest to God and the closest to truth and good and knowledge that we can get in this world. And human beings stepping up in front of that, more than just recognizing the subject matter or hearing the biblical stories that this art often represented, are brought into proximity to God. Thus, ideals are a way that artists through the ages have sought to bring you closer to perfection, closer to models for your own behavior and for your own aspirations. Now, write this down. You may want to pause this. I'm not going to slow this down. Like most lectures in this quarter, um, because they're all taped, unlike in a regular face-to-face -face lecture where I would repeat things over and over again, things might go fairly fast in these lectures because I believe you can always pause these or rewind them and look at them again if you didn't get the idea the first time through or you just want clarification on that. So in this case, what I'm showing you are uh, a list of the general stylistics of classical arts. And those, remember, classicism is a trans-historical style, so this set of uh, characteristics is generally applicable to art of Greece and art of Rome and art of the Renaissance and to art of the neoclassical period. It's another way of saying to you that these, um, well, saying to you this, once the artist has said, I want to create perfection, what did they think was perfect? What did they think was ideal? What did good art have to have to achieve what they wanted to achieve when they're classical artists? And you will have read Nicholas Poussin and Sir Joshua Reynolds kind of tell you what great art should have, and this is coming from this entire tradition. So number one at the top, we see that all great art has to have a grand subject matter, which means it has to start, as Nicholas Poussin says, with something that is full of human gravitas, something that is really profound and important. Now what Poussin meant is a little bit different than the Renaissance artists, but not so different. He meant that you couldn't start off, for instance, with a painting of flowers and expect it to do much. You know, it was always going to be limited by that simplistic subject matter. What Poussin and Sir Joshua Reynolds and all the neoclassical artists that we'll be covering were interested in were really profound subjects such as ancient history lessons or, uh, you know, things brought out of ancient Greek or Roman times or mythology or more often than not, religious subject matter. You had to start with that. Number two, and still up there on the top, all great art has to be concerned with one central concept to the art. Now, this will be easier to understand when I'm showing you examples of this, but uh, just in general, think of it this way. Most classical works of art have a moral lesson to teach you. And what they think is that all of the parts of the work of art, whether it be a painting or sculpture, has to be supportive of that central concept. So for instance, if the concept is uh, self-sacrifice, everything in the painting from the subject matter to the choice of the formal or visual elements of art uh, to the way that they're you know, arranged or composed in a work of art has to support that concept. It's kind of like you know, if you've ever read, uh, written an argumentative paper, your teacher probably said you have to have a strong thesis. That thesis is like the concept in a work of art. And in a paper, of course, everything in the body of the paper is supposed to be supporting that thesis. Same thing in works of art. They're, all the component parts are supposed to support the concept. Number two, everything in these works of art is supposed to be idealistic. So ideals, whether that be ideal bodies or relationships of bodies or ideal subject matter or ideal renderings of architecture, or ideal re representations of space, all of that has to be a part of the classical tradition. And we've given the reason for that, the aesthetic philosophy for that, because God 
beauty, truth, and goodness, they all go together. Related to the idea of everything being in the service of the concept is the classical idea of unity, that all parts add up to the whole such that nothing can be added or subtracted. This is a fancy way of saying that a unified work of art doesn't have any incidental subjects or little kinds of flourishes in it. It doesn't have, for instance, if you're uh, painting something and you just have an extra space, you don't just say, oh, I've got an extra space. Let me put a bird up there. Um, that bird has to have a reason for being there. Everything in the work of art has to have a reason for being there. It has to be unified around its concept. Further, all classical works of art are concerned with three very related concepts. Rationality, meaning something that appeals to the mind rather than the emotions. Clarity and order, which were also understood as appealing to the mind and to analytics rather than emotions. Things that are rational in works of art are things like perspectival systems. You'll learn about linear one-point perspective, for instance. Clear distinctions between a foreground, a middle ground, and a background, which you will have read about in your introductory chapter. That means that unlike our everyday world in which you see things kind of flow from things that are closer to us to things that are further away, classical artists tend to separate these into zones. Sometimes it's called the so-called classical rule of thirds, where every single kind of Part of a painting can be subdivided ever more into realms of thirds that are very tightly organized. Number three here, in order to make something rational, clear, ordered, and ultimately ideal, there's an emphasis on line rather than color. This is a little bit complicated, and so I'm going to save that idea until we start looking at works of art. But sharp, hard outlines are what we call contour lines in works of art. We're conceived to appeal to the mind, whereas fuzzy qualities, really exuberant colors, were understood to appeal to the emotions. An emphasis on stable compositions. Remember what a composition is. It's the way that things are arranged in the illusionistic space of a picture or in the actual space of a sculpture. In classical works of art, all compositions have to be very stable. Right? They, don't, they don't want them to look like they move. They want them to look like they're timeless. And so you don't have a lot of uh, diagonal compositions or things that are set up on diagonals because those achieve movement. Instead, you have a lot of what are called pyramidal compositions, things that are set up with a big triangle or pyramid kind of holding the work together. And we'll talk about these specifically when we look at works of art or lots of horizontal and vertical compositions because this is the most stable of most compositions. Just think of it this way. We all kind of interact with our world as a vertical being standing against a horizontal ground plane. Most of our architecture is set up on horizontals and verticals. It's a very, very stable composition. Balance and symmetry are also used in classical works of art. Balance means equal weight on both sides of a painting. And symmetry means a kind of mirror equivalent on each side of the painting. And classical artists tend to prefer analogous colors. Remember what this is when you looked at your introductory chapter. Analogous colors are colors that are close to each other on the color wheel. And complementary colors are opposite each other on a color wheel. Analogous colors actually harmonize with one another. Whereas complementary colors, so for instance, if you put a, uh, a red against a green, these are basically complementary colors, they will intensify the redness and the greenness of each color, and that tends to exacerbate our emotional response to things. And so classical artists stay away from those types of comp uh, combinations when they can. So this is just a list of some of the things that we expect to find in the classical arts. It's analyzing all the component parts of the classical arts to say this is something that we expect to find here that contributes to the idealism of this work of art. So just a couple more examples here before we get to uh, the neoclassical period. I think everyone's probably seen this work before. This is Michelangelo's famous The Creation of Man or The Creation of Adam on the Sistine Chapel ceiling. If you stop and you look at this for a minute, 
what you'll understand is that this is almost the perfect representation of these aesthetic ideas that we've just talked about. And what I mean by that is look at the body of God who is on the right and clothed and the body of Adam on the left. They are the same body with the same proportionality to them, right? What this is saying is that God created the perfect man in his image. And if I create the perfect man with per per perfect proportionality, what I'm doing is I'm letting you see something of God's perfection in the world around us, right? By the way, I should just say this. Um, I love this quote by Michelangelo, and it's a really interesting quote that I think many people have heard before, at least in passing, where Michelangelo once said, he was primarily a sculptor, some of you know, that the greatest art, this is his quote, the greatest artist has no conception which a single block of marble does not potentially contain within its mass, but only a hand obedient to the mind can penetrate to this image. And I've put that quote on your lecture guide for today. Think about this for a minute. This is a very Neoplatonic idea. What he's saying is that God put the perfection in the world that he lives in. That God, for instance, put the image of Adam in a marble block before he ever carved it away. And all he had to do was open himself, open his mind, his rational mind to a contemplation of God to see God's perfection in the world and basically carve away from that beautiful David sculpture everything that obscured God's perfection in the world. Thus, when you looked at David, what you're seeing is the closest approximation of God in the world around you. It was already there. Michelangelo just clears away the things that got in your way of seeing it. I'm going to pause here for a minute to get a drink of water. I will do this periodically throughout lectures. Um, you'll see very little, um, but uh, know that that's what I'm doing every time your screen does something like this. I'll be right back. Okay, so we're back. I'm back. And let's go on. We're jumping forward now uh, to the middle of the 17th century. You're looking at a work here. You don't need to remember this. It's a Hyacinth Rigo work of... It's a portrait of Louis XIV, the Sun King in France. And he's really important as a backdrop to our story because Louis XIV, the so-called Sun King, really threw a lot of money at making France the cultural center uh, of the world and it, it paid off. And one of the things that he did, and it's a longer story than this, but I'm just gonna give you the schematics because this is all just a backdrop, is that he established the first of what are known as the Royal Academies to the Arts. These are the Royal Academies. Before this time period, art was taught um, to younger artists by way of a workshop, right? You'd apprentice yourself to a master artist and learn their techniques and their aesthetic philosophy and so forth. And so it was a little idiosyncratic, right? One artist might have slightly different ideas than another. And Louis XIV decided that what he would do is establish a Royal Academy of the Arts um, to streamline both teaching exhibiting works of art and and techniques for uh, creating works of art by state sponsoring this Royal Academy. So in 1632 at the inauguration of the Royal Academy, you see this, um, this brief lecture that I gave you to read by Nicholas Poussin, who is the major painter under Louis XIV who describes what the aesthetic philosophy of the Royal Academy was. And it's very, very classical, isn't it? What Nicholas Poussin says is that right off the bat, all great works of art have to start from a grand subject, something with a lot of profound human import. What they called this was history painting. Second, Nicholas Poussin goes on to say that all great works of art have to be organized around a central concept, that key idea that the work of art is meant to, um, to embody. It's not just representing it, but actually embody the idea of some kind of moral concept that will edify you and make you a better person by viewing the work of art. Number three, Poussin says that all great works of art have to have structure. And that structure be, should be carefully derived from nature. Now, what Poussin means by this is not that you copy the way that the world looks, but rather you find God's perfection in the world, that perfect kind of arrangement 
in the world. And that arrangement is not just the placement of figures in a work of art, but also the use of particular color combinations and uses of line and so forth, so as to approximate God's perfection in the world. The last thing that Poussin says that an artist should have is his own personal style. That's not so important for our uh, story here. All he's saying is that every artist is going to be a little bit different and great artists have their own little flourishes that you'll find in works of art. Um, but you get the basic kind of aesthetic philosophy that then would be taught for the next basically 300 years in the French and English Royal Academies. Um, so that you know what great art should be trying to do. Now these Royal Academies also did something else. They not only taught artists how to, this aesthetic philosophy and how to paint in general, they also held every couple of years these major exhibitions and they were international affairs. Artists from all over Europe would strive to get their works exhibited in what were known as the Grand Salon, S-A-L-O-N, and this is almost always capitalized when it's referring to the Royal Academy exhibition. So every two years, and these started in the Louvre, which is that major Par uh, Parisian museum that used to be the palaces of the French kings, huge exhibitions of the greatest painters in Europe would be shown. First they were French, and then you know by the time that we're looking at, all European artists would submit works of art that they thought were their greatest works of art to a jury of the Royal Academy. And this jury was made up of other painters and architects and key figures in society who would look at the paintings and before they even accepted them, decide which works were good enough to be hung. They would then go up in the walls and they would go through another series of judgments determined by their genre. Genre in art has two different meanings. A genre could be something like a history painting, or like what you see here, a portrait, or a still life, or a landscape painting, each different class being a genre. And when you hear genre just in general, when someone says that's a genre painting, what they mean is an ordinary subject. So it, it has two different kinds of resonances. One, a particular type of painting, and another, a lowbrow or ordinary subject matter. In any case, these things would go up on the walls, they, the public would be invited to come look at these works of art, and the jury would select the most excellent of each of these art works and give them a, an award. If you were a young artist, the award you were trying to win was something called the Prix de Rome, the Prize of Rome. And if you won this award, it's kind of a kind of early career artist award, um, everyone would know your name. You won the Prix de Rome and you won an all expense paid continuation of your education in Rome for five years. And you would garner around you tons of patrons who would want your art and you would get better and better and so forth. Near the end of your career, the big award you wanted to win was the, the uh, kind of Legion of Honor Award, which is almost like a lifetime achievement award and so forth. The reason I bring this up is to say that this became the way that artists, uh, you know, competed with one another. It set a very standard way of thinking about what great art was, and everyone had to participate in these things. Otherwise, you wouldn't get patrons who are interested in buying your work. And so it perpetuated the idea that classical works of art were the most important works of art, they were the best works of art, and it set up a criteria by which they judged great works of art based upon these stylistics that I just gave you. Does it have this? Is it perfect proportions? Is it a grand subject? Is it all unified around a central concept and so forth? And this happens all the way through the 19th century. The, the, French Royal Academy is the biggest game in town and everyone are, is competing to win prizes in it and get their work shown in it so that they can get big patrons and make a living as an artist. So this is a, an example of Nicolas Poussin's work, just in case you're wondering what this guy that you read uh, was doing in his own work. This is a work that's called Et in Arcadia Ego. Um, it's a a Latin term that 
loosely translated means something like, I too once lived in Arcadia. So again, this is before our class really properly starts. We're still back there in, in this case in the Baroque period, looking at a precedent for the neoclassical period. But just briefly, let's go over this. Remember what Poussin said, all great works of art have to start with a grand subject. Well, you couldn't get a more profound subject than this because what we see here are three, what appear to be shepherds who have come across a tomb, uh, what's known as a uh, sarcophagus or a above ground funerary monument. And they're reading on the exterior of this monument, the Latin phrase, et in Arcadia ego. I too once lived in Arcadia. What that is meant to reference is something that in art history call a memento more or vanitas picture. It's meant to say, you're alive right now, just like I was once alive. I once too lived in Arcadia, which by the way, Arcadia, if you don't know, means a utopia, a perfect world. But now I'm dead, right? That's the profound subject. Human beings' lives are limited. We are all going to die. And so what do we do with that information? What do we strive to achieve knowing that our lives are limited? How could you get a more profound subject matter, right? He further goes on to say that, you know, of course, in his, uh, in his essay, Poussin says, all art has to be organized around a central concept. Well, the central concept here is if we're all going to die, what kind of mark do we want to make on the world and how do we or where do we look for inspiration or models for how we should act in the world? And this brings us to this figure over here, the woman. The woman is a muse in a way. A muse is a, a personification of inspiration. And in this case, she looks suspiciously like a Greek sculpture. Right? She looks like any number of sculptures you might find in Greek times, which is Poussin's way of saying that the concept here is in order to be perfect, in order to be the best you can be, the best human you can be, you should look to precedents in ancient times, such as the ancient Greeks who taught us about mathematics and geometry and philosophy and sciences and so forth. She is putting her hand on his shoulder to say, you want to know what you should do here? I'll let you know. Now you can go on with this and say, this is very, very tightly organized. It's structured in a way that is ideal. We see a foreground where all the figures are, then there's a kind of distance to the middle ground back here, and then a deep background back here. We have, as you will always find in classical works of art, what is called a focal point, F-O-C-A, L, right? The focus of the painting. And here it's achieved primarily through what we call implied line. Notice how the figure of the woman looks here. These figures point here. Those are all gestures that are implied lines that make us look at the focal point, which is the actual writing on the tomb that says et in Arcadia ego. And it also makes us look at the shadow cast by this figure. And shadows were symbolic of death. So all these things focus us there first. And you could keep going on with this. The colors are basically analogous. Um, it's a basically balanced form. If you split it down the middle, there's equal weight on both sides and on and on and on. Now, here's the little blip that happens just before our class proper starts or the neoclassical period starts. And I'm not going to go into all the ins and outs of this, but after Louis XIV died, Louis XV takes over and Louis XV has no interest in the same things that Louis XIV was interested in. He's basically a king who liked pleasure. Um, he starts having these grand, um, uh, what are known as kind of garden parties in Versailles where all the elegant aristocrats gather together in their latest fashions, and it's an age of intrigue, and, um, and you know, Louis XV had a million different mistresses that everyone knew about. It's about pleasure, and the art style that develops around this time period is known as the Rococo style. Um, I put in a, uh, you'll see in your module, just a little link to a clip of uh, one of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, if you haven't seen it before, 
you may want to take a look at it. It's called Dangerous Liaisons uh, with Glenn Close and uh, John Malkovich, and it even has a young Keanu Reeves and Uma Thurman. And it's all about this time period of the Rococo where all the aristocrats were full of sexual intrigue and being very fashionable and all of their houses were just kind of bling bling everything. The art responds to this, right? So it's not a classical style at all. This is a style that is meant to provoke your emotional response. It's meant to be playful and fun. It's, it's kind of like a soap opera in a way. So this is going on immediately preceding the period of neoclassicism where our class starts. And the work that you're looking at here is Jean-Antoine Vato's work on your lecture guide called Pilgrimage II, or On the Island of Cythera. Cythera was the mystical kind of birthplace uh, or home island of the goddess in Greek times known as Aphrodite. And in Roman times and in, in our contemporary language, we call her Venus, the goddess of love and beauty. So on this mystical isle, basically what you're seeing are very elegantly dressed aristocrats coupling up, you know, having a big party and entertaining themselves and flirting with each other and so forth. The art doesn't have uh, perfect proportions. It's not about idealism. It's about other things. It's about emotional enjoyment and pleasure in life and so forth. And this this type of genre is actually called a fetch uh, galant, a gallant festival or gallant kind of gathering. This is another work by Vato from the Rococo period. Uh, called the Signboard of Gerson. It's actually a sign that was hung out in front of a gallerist um, place of business where you sold paintings. And the big reason that I bring this in is to show, if you look carefully at what's on the wall, you see all these Rococo paintings, but over on the left-hand side, follow my cursor here, you see something pretty interesting. Over here, being put away into a crate, is a portrait of Louis the 14th, which is meant to be symbolic of a kind of putting away the old classical style. So this much more fun, playfully, sexually erotic, titillating work uh, could be bought by the contemporary public. Or another example of the Rococo period, one of the most kind of well-known Rococo paintings is this one by Jean-Ray Fragonard called The Swing. And again, this couldn't be any more diametrically opposed to Nicholas Poussin's Et in Arcadia Ego. Uh, what we see here is not a subject that's full of gravitas or human import. It's not a historical scene. It doesn't come out of Greek or Roman times. It's not religious. It's basically a dude who has conspired with another guy to place himself down here strategically so that as they swing this elegant, beautiful young lady, he can look up her skirt and it's all about sexual intrigue and so forth. Now, why do I bring that up here right before this class? Um, well, because the big reason is the neoclassical period comes back into France immediately following the Rococo period at the bequest of the government in a way. The government at this point in France, by the way, is the government of Louis XVI, who will be deposed by the French Revolution. And he's partially checked by a parliamentary system, Grand Assembly and the Third Assembly and so forth. You don't need to know the specifics of that. But Louis XVI, when he takes power, believes, first of all, that France is in a state of moral decline. And he points fingers at the Rococo period. He says, for instance, all of this frivolity, all of this interest in sexual intrigue and multiple mistresses and the flamboyant lifestyle of the aristocrats is something that is deteriorating the moral fabric of French society. That's one reason he doesn't like the Rococo and he likes the classical period because of course classical arts are meant to teach you or edify you of moral values. They're meant to produce models for our behavior and so forth. But the other reason is much more kind of political. Louis XVI knows that France uh, is one step away from getting rid of the monarchy. There's a lot of grumblings about that monarchy and he's worried about what this means. And so what he tries to do is 
support through, again, this major, major institution, the French Royal Academy, artists who are interested in creating classical works of art that are by their very nature conservative. What I mean by that is that they teach the idea that society shouldn't change, that there are laws in the universe that should remain constant and universal, that you know, this is always the way that things have been. And he wants to support artists who are interested in edifying the public with moral lessons that will further his position as a monarch in France rather than, uh, let's say, artworks that are about change or about new ideas and so forth. So I'm going to pause here. This is the end of lecture number one in a two-part lecture for this week. So now go on to lecture number two, where we'll pick up with the neoclassical period and look at the work of the major painters of this period, Jacques-Louis David in England, Sir Joshua Reynolds, and Benjamin West, Angela Kaufman, and Antonio Canova.